Hello, this is Yanis from Arquive with our serious interactive fiction, Learning from the Finest, where we present the finest examples of interactive fiction and see what we can learn from them in regard to game narrative design. In this episode, we'll talk about the shape-shifting protagonist of Meg Giant's 80 Days. 80 Days is, as the title suggests, a game adaptation of Jules Verne's classic novel Around the World in 80 Days. It was made by Inkle and released on 2014, and it won several awards and distinctions for its narrative merit. In the game, you play Jean Passepartout, the French Valley of English gambling gentleman Phileas Fogg, with the overwhelming task of helping your master circumnavigate the earth in 80 days or less, and win his wager against his mates at the Reform Club in London. Now, is it me or just, you know, some people seem to have a lot of time in their hands and money in their accounts? Indeed, time and money are the variables ruling this game's mechanics. You obviously have a deadline of whatever the game's title suggests, and you need money for tickets, hotels, and bribing people to go faster, as well as buying artifacts that you can then sell in other cities where they are more valuable, thus earning more money. If all else fails, you can always visit a local bank and request a withdrawal from Fogg's comfortable resources. Privilege. Let's first have a look at the mechanics of this quite complex story. I've created a simplified mock-up here on Arquive so we can understand how the game works. So let's say we have just arrived from London to Paris. We now have the option to explore, sell or buy stuff in the market and leave for the next destination if we know where we want to go. It is also an opportunity for experiencing the story, or rather stories, of the game. As with our visit, to the World's Fair of 1872. Once there, we can choose which pavilions to go to, and our choice triggers different scenes and some insight on possible next destinations like Amsterdam, Munich, and Vienna. We eventually return to the main screen of Paris, where we can now choose to depart. Being in time and having unlocked some destinations, we can now depart towards hmm, Vienna, which is uh, disappointingly without any story content. And this is where this mock-up ends. But more engaging than the game's mechanics are the actual stories that unfold throughout the journey around the world. And Passepartout, being a resourceful valet, he can dive into those stories with shape-shifting abilities. So what is a shapeshifter after all? According to Christopher Vogler's book The Writer's Journey, in storytelling we encounter several character archetypes, including but not limited to the hero, the mentor, the shadow, and the shapeshifter. Vogler stresses out that those archetypes are not specific characters as much as masks that any character can wear on different occasions. Ah, uh, no, not that kind of mask. Eh, yeah, perhaps. Therefore, a shapeshifter is not necessarily a character who is a spineless villain, but it can simply be any person exposing different sides of themselves on different occasions, something most of us do most of the time. Passepartout seems to have developed this shape-shifting ability to an admirable extent, perhaps as a defense mechanism to cope with the complex task of balancing a rigid and austere master while touring through various cultures around the world. In other words, Passepartout is quite a chameleon, and we the player complete the puzzle of his evasive nature through choosing for him the moods he has, the status games he plays with other people, or the political views he expresses. The name itself, in French, literally means the key that opens every door. So, most of the time we have the choice to approach a scene with various moods. For example, when reaching a new city, we always have the choice to have a positive or a negative first reaction, justified by what Passepartout chooses to focus on at that very moment. And this happens with any subject of conversation as well, as when a woman asks you how Paris is like. Then there is our character's class identity paradox. Passepartout is privileged enough to be touring around the world, but he's also a valet, bound to the will and whims of his master even when Fogg orders him to start a mutiny on a ship. 
Passepartout never really questions his master's superior status. What he does, though, is playing at both sides when it comes to outsiders and locals, presenting himself as a gentleman or as working class, depending on whether he wants to impress or inspire a sense of camaraderie to another laborer. Finally, there is a question of how politically committed Passepartout considers himself. On several occasions, you meet rebels and resistance members, and you choose how to present yourself to them, as someone opposed to their goals, in line with them, or someone who says, don't mind me, I'm just passing through. Even if you choose to empathize and help locals with their political struggles, the story's ticking clock and your dual status as a servile valet and a privileged tourist make any attempt of political empathy fleeting and shallow. Even if Passepartout has good intentions, he eventually chooses his privileged servility. There seem to be mechanics associated with these choices and their outcomes, but they seem to be in place more often for the flavor of the story and less often to present obstacles to the goal of circumnavigating the globe. Is this a bad thing? Absolutely not. Actually, those little variations add a whole extra layer to the game's narrative, making the story even more dynamic and satisfying. 80 Days is a vast text game. With more than 160 cities, you have, I don't know, probably thousands of ways to play it. You can choose where to go and how you feel about it, while at the same time push forward to win the bet, and experience some stories along the way, and do some trading. There are times that your decisions delay the journey and you can always lose the wager. <laughs> But you don't really experience this as a punishment or a failure. You can simply replay the game, make different choices, give Passepartout a different attitude, take different paths and read different stories. And this is for me what 80 Days is about. Okay, and winning the bloody wager. So that was Meg Giant's 80 Days. If you like this video, please give a thumbs up and you can also subscribe to the Arcweave channel because there will be more. Or perhaps you want to design your own games, interactive fiction or not, you can use Arcweave to organize your material, turn your ideas into a playable prototype and even publish it as a choice-based game to share with the world. This is Yanis from Arcweave. Thank you for watching and let the games begin. Yeah.